vectors in the plane. We're going to talk about vectors whose components are from the set of real numbers. Before we talk about vectors, we need to talk about what a real number is. The set of real numbers is often denoted with an R and an extra line, sometimes called a blackboard bold R. This set can contain positive numbers, negative numbers, fractions, square roots of numbers, irrational numbers, numbers such as pi that are transcendental. The only types of numbers we are not interested in, square roots of negative numbers or imaginary numbers. All our vectors are constructed using real numbers. Now R2 is how we'll denote a set of pairs of real numbers. This notation means R2 is a set of x comma y such that, the bar means such that, x and y are in the set of real numbers. So for instance, something like negative radical 2 comma pi squared over 6, that is in the set R2. Now another thing to note when we're talking about these points is that 3 comma 4 and 4 comma 3, they're not the same thing. Order makes a difference. So if I have two points, x comma y and u comma v, they're only equal when the numbers in both positions are equal. When x is equal to u, the first is equal to the first, and y equals v. Now, let's talk about two points. Um, the point 1 comma 2 and the point 3, no, the point 7 comma 5. Two excellent points. Now I can graph these two points. I'll draw an x-y axis and let's say the point A is right here and the point B is approximately here. So what I'm interested in now is how do you get from A to B? In other words, I'm interested in the directed line segment from A to B. Now I'm going to use angle brackets to distinguish this from a point. In traveling from A to B, I go a distance of 6 in the x direction and 3 in the y direction. I travel over 6 and up 3 units. So I'll call this 6 and I'll call this side 3. A vector describes a path. A is the point at which we start. It's sometimes called the initial point. B, the point at which we end. Sometimes that's called the terminal point. Those are the official names. And 6 comma 3 is the vector between them. Now let's take a look at two different points. Let's have the point C, negative 2 comma 3. It'll be right around here. And the point D, 4 comma 6, is right around here. Let's say I want to draw a vector connecting these two points. Well, how can you describe that vector? Well, you do the same calculation as before. To travel from C to D, what's your change in the x direction and what's your change in the y direction? So as before, we do some subtraction. We find that we get 6, 3 for the vector CD. So this is what makes vectors really different from points. In order to get from A to B, or in order to get from C to D, you have to do the same thing go over 6 in the x direction and go up 3 in the y direction. So even though they're different as line segments, the paths we follow are equivalent. They are equivalent as vectors. So let's say I have a vector. I'll call it V. I don't always have to use the initial point and the end point. In a textbook, you usually see it written as a bold face lowercase letter. I'll often write it with an arrow over it because it's a little bit easier. 
And we often use the same letter for the vector as for each of its components, so we don't have to think up a bunch of new letters. But think of a vector, if you remember slope, you might think of slope as rise over run, a vector stores the same kind of information. Think of a vector as containing run information and rise information. Difference in x and difference in y. If you want to find the slope of a vector, you just have to take the quotient of its components, v2 over v1. Now, you might wonder, how can you graph a vector? A vector tells you how you change from one point to another, but it doesn't tell you what the start point is. So the truth is, you know, we just choose one point, and we'll call that standard position. If you want to graph a vector, you normally just assume it starts at the origin. You could start it at any point you want, but if a point, an initial point, is not specified, we'll often just graph them in this position. The point at the origin, we'll often call that the zero vector. A zero with a line over it, an arrow over it, really refers to the vector where we do no change in x or y. Now, once you have two vectors, there's many things you can do with them, besides just drawing pictures of them. So the first operation we should talk about is vector addition. Just as you can add two numbers, you can add together two vectors. So let's say I have the vector v with components v1 and v2, and the vector w with components w1 and w2. What should it mean to add these two vectors together? Well, we will define the sum as we add together the first components, and we add together the second components. So, for example, if we have the vector 2, comma, 5, and the vector 3, comma, negative 7, if we were to add these together, we just go component by component. 2 plus 3 is the new first component. 5 plus negative 7 is the new second component. So this is the vector 5, comma, negative 2. In other words, if you travel along the first vector and travel along the second, the result is equivalent to the result encoded in their sum. Now there's a very interesting visual way to show what the significance of vector addition is. Let's say I have a vector, I'll call it A, then another vector in another color, I will call that one vector B. Now what does it mean to add these two together? Well, if we're going to do A plus B, remember there's nothing special about the position of a vector. All that matters is that it's the same length and pointing in the same direction. So this vector up here with the dotted green line, that's also vector B. If I put it in that location, traveling along A, then along B, is equivalent to traveling along the vector A plus B. Now, there's nothing special about traveling along A first and B second. If you traveled along B first and then A second, you'd get to the same point. In other words, just like normal addition is commutative, so is vector addition. A very interesting thing is that you notice taking A and B and their sum, if you take a look at the terminal points of these vectors, if you take a look at well, first the origin, then the terminal point of A, the terminal point of B, and the terminal point of A plus B, those four points form the vertices of a parallelogram. Sometimes that's called the parallelogram law of vector addition. Now another operation you can do with vectors, you can multiply a vector times a constant number. This word scalar really just means a number, specifically in the set of real numbers. Sometimes we'll call just a regular constant number a scalar to distinguish it from a vector. 
let's say I have a scalar named C and a vector named V, what does it mean to multiply a vector times a scalar? Well, we're going to define that by we multiply each component of the vector times the scalar number C. So for example, let's say our scalar is 2, our vector is 3 comma 4. What do we get when we multiply 2 times the vector 3, 4? We'll get 2 times 3 comma 2 times 4, which simplifies to 6 comma 8. So the result is another vector. Now there's an important way to think about scalar multiplication geometrically, just as there was with vector addition in the parallelogram law, scalar multiplication has another interpretation as well. Let's say this is the vector v, the vector 3 comma 4. The vector 2 times v is 6 comma 8. If I were to draw that vector, it points in the same direction as v, but it turns out it's twice as long. In other words, multiplying a vector by 2 has doubled its length. What if I take a vector v and I multiply it by 1 half? Well, 1 half times 3 and 1 half times 4 gives you 1.5, 2. If you graph it in standard position again, you'll notice that 1 half times v again points in the same direction as v and it's half as long. So scalar multiplication literally scales a vector. Changes its size, but not direction. Now what if we multiply by a negative number, say negative 1? In this case, I'll graph that here in red. You'll notice it's pointing in the opposite direction, but it has the same length. We've just reversed the coordinates, x and y. Now what if I multiply by a negative number other than 1? For instance, negative 1 half. It's like putting together the previous two calculations. Multiplying it by a negative changes its direction, reverses the direction, and if the number is not equal to 1, then it scales the vector. So negative 1 half v is like the reflection of 1 half v might notice that all these vectors, well, they're all pointing in the same direction. Let's say they're all parallel to each other. It turns out this is true in general. One vector is parallel to another exactly when that vector is a constant multiple of the other. This is true wherever they're located. Now, if we've talked about vector addition, only makes sense to talk about vector subtraction. The great thing about vector subtraction is really is just a combination of the two operations we've already discussed. You could think of v minus w as v plus negative 1 times w. So it's a combination of addition and scalar multiplication. And we define it in just the way that you expect. Now vector subtraction also has a geometric interpretation that is useful to know. Realizing what's going on geometrically gives us a different way to think about these operations, which will come in handy later. Now, how could I draw a picture of the vector v minus the vector w? Well, first I'll draw v and negative w. And then I'll take negative w and I'll translate it. Again, the position of the vector isn't important, just the direction it's pointing in. So, v plus negative w is really this vector here. Drawing a long v and then a long negative w has that result. But of course, you could translate the vector to any position you want, and so you notice v, w, and v minus w form the sides of a triangle.